Uh, folks, uh, welcome everyone to the Party School of Global Studies. My name is Adil Rajam. Welcome to the people who are joining us online. I just wanted to welcome all of you to the Party School, to our alumni weekend, and to this very special event on a special topic, 20th anniversary of 9-11. We have been, this is something that many of you, all of you, are thinking about in various ways, and we will keep thinking about we have had a series of events on this a uh, whole number of years, and they've all been um, organized by Professor Joe Wilkins. So I'm going to hand over to him and really welcome a wonderful panel of friends and colleagues to help us understand this moment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, uh, the third uh, in a series that has gone on every uh, five years. Uh, so to speak, commemorating 9-11, uh, the event of 9-11. Uh, we started for uh, 10 years, uh, 15 years, and now we're in a 20-year retrospect, re retrospective of what happened. Uh, I think uh, the two people who are going to speak on these issues, and I think it's a pretty broad-based issue uh, that we can talk about because it's been subsumed by other things, economic crisis, uh, the pandemic, and so on. Yet in itself it was a, certainly a major event in American history and one that, that I won't forget. Uh, on my uh, far right, but not that he's on the far right, uh, is uh, David Greenway. Uh, David was actually born in Boston and uh, was educated at Yale and Oxford, uh, joined Time Magazine in 1962. In 1967, proceeded to be sent to Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia as a journalist. He even won the Bronze Star there, uh, which is uh, unusual, I would say, for someone who was not in the military, uh, but it was for saving uh, a Marine's life. Uh, he, uh, and noteworthy, I think, is uh, there are not too many people who are on the roof of the Saigon Embassy and so it was being vacated, uh, uh, but he was one. Uh, and he noted, has noted to me that was the last time uh, he had seen or talked to our chief of station, <clears throat> leaving that uh, Tom Bogar at the time. He joined the Washington Post in 1972, sent back to Hong Kong and back to Saigon uh, to report. Joined the uh, Boston Globe in 1978, uh, where he built up a foreign uh, news service. Uh, he was, as a matter of fact, uh, the editor-in-chief of the foreign news service at the Boston Globe. He's written uh, uh, just absolute countless articles, obviously, uh, a memoir, uh, as well as a uh, book on, on Woodrow Wilson. Uh, to my right uh, is uh, a colleague, former colleague, now Professor Emeritus, uh, Andrew Basevich. Andrew is the president of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. Born in Illinois, he's a graduate of West Point, served in Vietnam, Germany and the Persian Gulf. He also has a PhD in history from Princeton University. He taught at BU from 1998 to 2016, uh, which was, uh, I think, a great experience for all of us who had a chance to uh, teach with him during that period of time. He's written many books on security, uh, beginning with the American Empire, and his latest work is After the Apocalypse. Uh, recently, I read a, uh, uh, a review of a book on uh, uh, Andrew Sullivan by David French. Uh, a quote from there is, a nation needs writers and thinkers who will say hard things, whose fearlessness gives you confidence that you're hearing their true thoughts. I can't imagine two people uh, uh, that, that reflects more uh, that I've known in my life than these two. Uh, so, uh, David, would you like to begin? All right. I'm going to take my mask off, which I, our dean has said I could do, and that I want to assure you I've had three shots. If this uh, talk had a title, it would be Saigon to Kabul, Half a Century of American Misadventures. <laughs> um, I watched in, in nearly half a century ago, um, the Army of South Vietnam that had been trained and equipped by the United States simply melt away before a less well-equipped 
and a much better motivated army in North Vietnam. The South Vietnamese fled in panic before the North's final offensive. I, I saw soldiers taking off their uniforms and running away in their underwear. And South Vietnamese cities were falling even before the North Vietnamese had a chance to get there. In the end, I had to leave in a hurry, as uh, Joe said, from the embassy in a helicopter with the, I could see below me the seats, the street seething with panicked people we were leaving behind. Um, in 30 years of effort, first for the French whose colony Vietnam had been, and then for ourselves, 30 years of effort was going up in smoke. In 2014, another American trained and American equipped army, the Iraq, packed up and ran away before the less well equipped um, um, Islamic State forces when they attacked Mosul. And of course, last month, a similarly trained American equipped army of Afghanistan collapsed before a less well equipped, but better motivated, better motivated Taliban. Long before those disasters had become clear to me during visits to Baghdad and Kabul that America had not learned the lessons of Vietnam. There's been a strong element of hubris in American foreign policy before and after 9-11, resulting in perhaps one of the greatest overreactions in history, the invasion of Iraq. There were no Iraqis involved in the attack in America this September 11th. Harvard Steve Wolf put it perfectly when he wrote that after the fall of the Soviet Union, instead of defending our, its own shores, maximizing prosperity and well being at home, Washington sought to remake other countries in its own image and, in, and incorporate them into situations and arrangements of its own design. I've just finished reading Andy's new book, and he speaks of the monumental arrogance in the inner circles of power that led America, Americans to misapprehend their place in the global order. I think you need to step back for a minute and put this in a larger historical context. What Walt described is what colonial powers have always done. The Portuguese and the Spanish in their ships first pushed forth into the oceans to gain the riches of the Indies and the New World they always dressed up their ambitions in, in claiming that they were saving souls, converting the heathens to Christianity, making people more like themselves. The, the later, the French always claimed their colonial mission was civilisatrice, bringing Western civilization and the French language to the unenlightened to make their colonized people more like Frenchmen. And the British too claimed they were bringing law and order and enlightenment to what Brendan Kipling called, quote, new court sullen people, half devil and half child. That was in his famous poem, encouraging Americans to take up the white man's burden to join the Empire Club after we acquired the Philippines. When spreading Christianity faded as an imperial cause, Americans began to fixate on spreading democracy to their new court sullen peoples to make other countries more like ourselves. Democracy out of the barrel of a gun. We, in Vietnam, we saw through our lens a fight against communism. But to many Vietnamese, perhaps most, we were just another foreign invader following in the footsteps of the French. We did not understand that to many, perhaps most people in the world, uh, colonialism was more, uh, anti colonialism was more important than struggle against communism. General de Gaulle tried to warn us when in 1966 he said, There is no chance the peoples of Asia will subject themselves to the laws of a foreigner who comes from the other shores of the Pacific, whatever his intentions however powerful his weapons. And likewise in Afghanistan, 
well, we were looking through the lens of, of fighting Islam, Islam and Islamic extremism. Many Afghans, and then perhaps most, saw the struggle as against us as another foreign invader, not unlike the Russians and the British before them. And through the Afghan lens, the struggle was more ethnically centered. Tajiks, Uzbeks versus Pashtuns, who were the largest ethnic group. In the later stages of the war, the overwhelmingly Pashtun Taliban began to pick up support among other ethnicities, but it was clearly a Pashtun force. But as in Vietnam, our Afghan clients could never capture the high ground of nationalism. Our South Vietnamese could never shake the image of being American puppets. Similarly, our Afghans always appeared as American puppets. Afghan President Ashraf Ghani, an intelligence, well-meaning former World Bank official, whom I interviewed several times in Kabul, always seemed to be the ultimate American puppet whose power was simply an extension of American power. The Taliban put out a propaganda question to its Afghan people while I was there. Would you rather be Dost Muhammad or Shah Susha, they asked. I went around to the Americans and said, what do you think of this? What's, what's the meaning of this? And almost nobody had any idea. But the Afghans knew very well that Dost Muhammad was the Afghan king who the British had deposed, I think it was 1839. And Shah Suja was the king they, the British put on the throne of Afghanistan. The Afghans also knew that the British were driven out of Kabul in 1842 and lost an army uh, in that terrible winter in the passes of the Hindu Kush. Um, the great, perhaps the greatest disaster in British colonial history. The Afghans put Dost Muhammad back on the throne. So the, the Afghans stood, understood very well what, what the Taliban was saying. A second link between disasters in Vietnam and Afghanistan was corruption. We could never curb corruption in Afghanistan. And we contributed to it by flooding the country with more money than the economy could possibly absorb. Corruption drained away support for the government. A friend of mine on an operation in the Afghan army saw officers demanding bribes from visitors they were supposed to protect. He asked, do you think you're going to win the support of the population that way? We know, said the officers, but we had to pay bribes to get our commissions. And this is how we get our money back. A third link between the disaster in Vietnam and Afghanistan is that too few Americans bothered to learn the history and culture of the country. Often this because America's belief in American exceptionalism. I asked a senior officer in Vietnam if he'd ever read, ever read about the French experience in Vietnam. He said, no, why should I? They lost, didn't they? <laughs> Robert McNamara admitted to me after the war that he never understood the other his culture and history. A lot of people have tried to tell him, but he wasn't interested. In Iraq, I found that very many Americans didn't even know of the great schism in the Muslim religion between Sunni and Shia. They didn't care to know. They were Americans. They were going to bring American democracy to Iraq. My friend Tony Shadid of the Boston Globe, who was later uh, of the New co covered Syria and, and, uh, for the New York Times and was and died. Um, he was listening to the Afghan, sorry, the Iraqi soldiers talking. They didn't know he was fluent in Arabic. And one was saying the other, I know I'm a bad Muslim fighting for foreigners, but I need the money. <laughs> The invasion of Iraq was the result of magical thinking of the neoconservatives. They believed that if they could transform Iraq into something resembling America, then the entire Middle East would follow suit, autocracies would crumble, and, and American style democracy would reign. Henry Kissinger, who was originally in favor of the Iraq War, later wrote that seeking to impose American values by military occupation 
in a part of the world where they had no historical roots and expect fundamental political change in politically relevant period of time prove beyond what the American public would support and what Iraqi society could accommodate. In Kabul, I interviewed the Russian ambassador. He had been, as a young man, um, in the uh, Soviet occupation in Kabul. And now he was back as ambassador during the American occupation. And he said, you know, you Americans make the same mistakes we did. But we thought that every Afghan, if he had a choice, would like to be a communist. And some did. And you think every Afghan, if he had a choice, would like to be an American. And some do. But you think purple ink on your Afghan finger showing their vote is the answer to a thousand years of tribal and ethnic tribal rivalry. The temptation to make Afghanistan over in America's image was doomed from the start. We never should try to install a self central government with all power to Kabul. It went against the Afghan tradition of decentralized states. We didn't appreciate that Uzbeks and Tajiks had their militias. And so the Taliban had become the Pashtun militia and we should have included them in our discussions of a new government that we took over. We were insensitive to our Afghan traditions when they conflicted with our own. American officials boasted to me how many American women they had out in the countryside working alongside them. Well, in rural Afghanistan, especially in the Pashtun areas, uh, this is uh, culturally offensive and counterproductive to winning over the population, even though we might believe it. Another link between Afghanistan and Vietnam was American self-deception. Some would call it lies. In Vietnam, it was always light at the end of the tunnel. We were always winning the war. It became so ridiculous that we called the briefings the five o'clock fallings after the hour when the military briefed the press every day. In Baghdad and in Kabul, I found the same. In Afghanistan, we were always turning the corner. We were always going to win the war. The American military's can-do spirit, so attractive in one sense, became a millstone in losing wars. Our military may have known that the wars were hopeless, but they weren't about to admit it. Defeatism was unacceptable. It was always darkest before the dawn, they told themselves. The old saying, the difficult will be done promptly, the impossible will take a little longer, is ingrained in the military. And had not Julius Caesar said, it's, it's only humorous if I lose? There was no incentive for the military tradition to say, sorry, the task is set for us, can't be done. When I was in Baghdad, I met General Martin Dempsey, later chairman of the Joint Chiefs, but then he was in charge of training the Iraqi army. He said it was comparatively easy to train a man to fight, harder to master the logistics, keeping an army fed and supplied with ammunition. But what we can't do is instill in the Iraqis the motivation to fight. That the only Iraqis can do themselves, he said. I also felt that both in Afghanistan and Vietnam, we were equipping our clients to fight big, complicated wars, not the light infantry wars that our opponents were fighting. We created a, a dependency that need have not have been. I was truly shocked to read that after 20 years, the Afghans were still completely dependent on American contractors to service their aircraft. Shouldn't we have trained the Afghans to service their own planes in 20 years? As for the Afghans, the Taliban, Afghans are not an enemy you want to fight in their own turf. They, they have a strong tradition of jihad against foreign invasives, <coughs> invaders. They were master of terrain. Once when I visited a Mujahideen training camp uh, in Afghanistan, during the Soviet war, they showed me how they threw their robes over their heads 
and crouched down on the ground and became almost invisible to helicopters and plane, planes flying overhead. And they showed me how they even hid their hands lest their fingernails should reflect the light. And talk about a military tradition. In 1936, when the British were fighting the Waziristan campaign, when it was over, the British were handing out medals to their troops. The Waziris came to the British and said, where are our medals? And the British said, what are you talking about? You were the enemy. And the Waziri said, well, perhaps so, but you couldn't have had a Waziristan campaign without us. We, we, we're American military and civilian griefers lying to us when they told us how we were winning these wars. There were plenty of outright lies, God knows. But I prefer Sebastian Junger's description of the military and political briefings that the Americans gave us in Kabul. Rather than outright lie, they were inviting us to join a conspiracy of wishful thinking. When Saigon fell and the Vietnam was over, Roger Rotman, who was the foreign minister of Singapore and a great friend of America, said that the true meaning of the war's end was not that communists had won. He was decidedly anti-communist, but for the first time in 400 years, there were no foreign armies in Southeast Asia. Maybe something similar is being said by even by Americans' friend, America's friends now that we're out of Afghanistan. I hope you publish that. Uh, number one. And uh, number two, I'll just note a, a meeting uh, when I was in Congressional Affairs uh, with uh, the minority leader, uh, Harry Reid, who said, she is Sunni is Kurds. Who the hell are all these guys? And and, and so on. Uh, it uh, uh, it uh, reflect. It's reflective of a lot of things that you touched on. Andy, are you ready? Well, I, I would begin by saying uh, I agree with everything that David just said. So I can I can make my presentation somewhat uh, briefer. Uh, so I was here on Base State Road on 9/11. Uh, I, I cannot remember specifically. You know, who told me I didn't have a TV in my office. Or uh, but I learned about the attack and then went to class and, and told uh, my students what had just happened. Nor do I remember exactly how we then proceeded through the rest of the, of the, of the class period. Uh, I do specifically remember that I didn't have any great wisdom to offer. Uh, you know, the country was what? Shocked? Frightened, angry, confused. Well, I was certainly all those things uh, in trying to come to terms with, uh, to understand uh, what had just occurred. Remember all the airlines were shut down for at least a few days. Uh, I had to fly to Washington for some brother uh, a week, 10 days or so later. Didn't fly, I flew into BWI uh, in Baltimore. I remember the lines, you know, to get through. There was no uh, uh, separate security service at the time. So it was incredible just being able to, uh, to get to the gate. And I also remember being very, very nervous because it was, it was not apparent uh, that the 9-11 attack was gonna be a one-off kind of event. There was, there was genuine concern that I bought into. This was gonna be part of, uh, of a, larger campaign that we were just, you know, we had just taken the first step of what was going to be uh, a terror terrorism campaign afflicting the United States. You all remember how we had that uh, anthrax scare uh, where there were some envelopes uh, that were sent to Capitol Hill, I think. Uh, and uh, when it was discovered uh, what it was, you know, again, it appeared that there was, there was sort of phase two of Al Qaeda's operations. Uh, so if anything I say today suggests that I had all this figured out, then you should immediately dismiss that because I certainly, I certainly did not. Um, I did soon thereafter uh, begin to develop some fairly strong opinions regarding the US government's response to 
to 9-11. Uh, and I came to believe that that response was really informed by our collective interpretation of the significance of the end of the Cold War. I think uh, David's, you know, a year, 18 months older than I am. Uh, but we're, we're both basically, uh, you know, a little more than that. Children, <laughs> children, children of the Cold War, not children of the Cold War. Our, our, our young adulthood uh, was spent during the Cold War. I don't know how you felt about it, but uh, as, a, as a young person, by then I was serving in the Army uh, in the 70s and in the 1980s, I was absolutely persuaded without thinking about it that the Cold War was never going to end. The, the, the international system was the Cold War. The Cold War was the international system. Basically, if you understood what the Cold War was all about, you, you had a, a sufficient grasp of the international politics. Uh, somewhat conveniently, that meant that all you really had to pay attention to was uh, the East-West relationship. Uh, you know, the North-South relationship could be conveniently uh, ignored altogether. So when the Cold War ended, uh, it appeared, not just to relatively uneducated or ignorant people like me, but certainly appeared uh, to the foreign policy establishment in Washington, and one might even say more broadly, members of the American and Western intelligentsia. It appeared that something profound had happened. History had turned a page. Indeed, to cite a famous, a famous essay by Francis Tsukuyama, history itself had ended. All the big questions had been settled. The winner had been declared. The winner was the United States of America. And the form of liberal democratic capitalism that, that was at the center of our understanding of politics and of our understanding of how the world was supposed to work. So, it, and, and also, I should emphasize that the, the outcome of the Cold War, the collapse of, of the Soviet Union, the Soviet Empire, the discrediting of communism, was interpreted by many American observers at the time, particularly members of the national security apparatus, interpreted as a military victory. True, the Cold War had ended without a shot being fired, but the notion took hold that the reason the Russians gave up, reasons the Soviets decided that further competition with the United States uh, made no sense, was because, we believed, they had come to the conclusion that continuing a competition with us was simply a futile exercise. A, competition, a military competition, I should emphasize. That our, our edge in weaponry, in military expertise, in the competence in waging war was now so great that it was pointless to, for them to, to keep on trying. You'll recall Cold War, uh, the Berlin Wall goes down October 1989, uh, August of 1990, less than a year later, Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait. And suddenly, even though the history has ended, we now have the first fairly substantial military undertaking of the post-Cold War era. We remember it as Operation Desert Storm. What happened in Operation Desert Storm? Well, the American interpretation is that we went to war against what was said to be the fourth largest army in the world, and we walked up on the Iraqi army pretty darn good. <laughs> the fact that we didn't over get rid of Saddam Hussein at the time, which was actually the option that didn't matter, but we walked up on the, on the, on the Iraqi army pretty good, thereby burying all the bad memories about Vietnam. Didn't need to think about Vietnam anymore because we now showed that we knew how to win. And, that, and in other words, that Operation Desert Storm compounds or reinforces the, the conclusion of what the end of the Cold War signified. We were ideologically superior, our system, there was no alternative to our system, and we were militarily supreme. So it appeared to many people in Washington, and again, policy intellectuals, not all, but many, as we get into, move into the 1990s. What's the result? Well, the result, I think, I think this is crystal clear in retrospect, the result is extraordinary hubris, 
informed by ideological arrogance and militarism informed by a mistaken reading of what the end of the Cold War and Operation Desert Storm actually signify. What's the upshot? Well, the upshot is now a, a pattern of American interventionism that basically begins with the presidency of George Herbert Walker Bush. It's totally forgotten, it's totally forgotten. Berlin Wall goes down in October, 1989. By December, we're intervening in Panama. First of the post-Cold War interventions. So it's under the presidency of George Herbert Walker Bush and Bill Clinton. And of course, then George W. Bush, that we have this pattern of intervention culminating after 9-11, all those are small interventions, relatively brief, culminating after 9-11 in sort of the big, the, 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 big, the big wars of Afghanistan and Iraq. Afghanistan not perceived to be a big war initially because it seems to end quickly. False conclusion ends up being the longest in our country. The Iraq war, bigger by almost any measure in terms of casualties sustained, casualties inflicted, uh, uh, costs uh, incurred, also seemingly begins on a positive note, but turns out to be something else again. So uh, to me, that is, that's the big story. The, the, the big story is hubris and militarism combining to uh, distort US policy and resulting us doing in a whole bunch of pretty stupid things. Uh, with the global war on terrorism probably being uh, the most stupid of all. Uh, and here we are, there's been a lot of chit chat uh, that, uh, you know, the, the era of endless war is now over, and the forever wars have ended. That is almost certainly misleading. Uh, the, the, the end of the Afghanistan war doesn't end. What do we call the global war on terrorism these days? Sort of, it's become the nameless war, but it certainly doesn't end the American the forever, uh, war. The forever war. Involvement in the greater Middle East, we still have troops in Syria, we still have troops in Iraq, still have troops in, uh, uh, in uh, various parts of Africa. Again, once, once again, the, the level of involvement may be smaller, but I would argue that that struggle uh, continues. How do we read the implications? Uh, is the Afghanistan, is the conclusion of the Afghanistan war a turning point? Or as the president favorite phrase that he uses over and over again, is it an, an inflection point? Inflection point in our history, an inflection point in, in world history. Uh, of course, the answer is uh, it's too soon to tell. Uh, we really don't know. Uh, it, 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 I think we, one of the reasons we don't know is we don't exactly know what Biden means by that phrase. Uh, on the one hand, uh, if we look at, for example, his speech to the UN General Assembly of what is it, two weeks ago now, maybe three weeks ago now, uh, he, uh, he talks about uh, he talks about the, the era of the forever wars being over. He talks about a move away from interventionism. He talks about a more collaborative, cooperative approach to American leadership. Well, you know. Where's the beef? You know, show me. Uh, a, a couple of friends of mine have observed that the House of Representatives recently passed a uh, military spending bill that ups the uh, Pentagon budget to its highest ever level. Now, I don't believe the Senate has acted yet, but I have not heard Biden expressing any uh, disagreement uh, with these high levels of, of military spending. We have the fascinating episode of the, uh, the joint deal between uh, the UK and the US to sell uh, nuclear submarines to Australia, They're basically stabbing the French in the back. Well, not what happened. Uh, and I don't, I'm, not, I'm not particularly, I don't feel sorry for the, the, the France's military industrial complex, uh, but I do think that that is suggestive. It's one more piece of evidence, but it's suggestive of an administration that is willing to, to consider the possibility, maybe even welcome the possibility of a new Cold War with the People's Republic of China. The language of the administration 
uh, emphasizes, actually, it's the, this was some of the language from the Trump era, even if Trump probably didn't believe it, uh, but the language emphasizes a new era of great power competition. But that's the, the world we're going into from the point of view of Biden and his advisors as we're moving into an era of great power competition. Well, come on, let's get serious. That means a new Cold War pitting the United States and, and its allies against the People's Republic of China. There aren't any other great powers that we're going to be competing with uh, in, in the near term. Whether that's going to happen, I think, genuinely is too soon to tell, because we hear out of the other, other side of the president's mouth, uh, the part that I like, uh, talking about the imperative of getting serious about other crises like, uh, like climate. Can we, can we engage in a great power competition centered on the US-China relationship and also collaborate with the People's Republic of China in addressing the climate crisis. Uh, maybe that's possible, but strikes me as really, really, really difficult. I personally think the climate crisis actually is, poses a more immediate threat to our well-being uh, than does uh, anything the People's Republic is doing in the South China Sea or wherever, which I think gets to what would be my final point, and that is the what I'll call the national security paradigm. Uh, from the time I was born in 1947, I was born right at the beginning of the Cold War. Throughout the Cold War and in the post-Cold War era, the prevailing national security paradigm was one that began with the assertion that the threats endanger, endangering our well-being, well-being of the American people, the safety of the American people, were threats out there. There were threats in Europe. There were threats in East Asia. Beginning in the 1980s, there were threats in the Persian Gulf. They were far away. And there were threats that required a military response. To, pre to, to, to prepare to deal with those threats meant that we had to amass military power. And of course, we had to be prepared to use military power, which of course, in more than a few instances, we then did. That was the prevailing concept during the Cold War. That was the prevailing concept after the Cold War. That was the prevailing concept during the global war on terror that led us to do what we did in Iraq and Afghanistan. I don't think that thinking works anymore. It seems to me that the, the, the threats that we ought to worry about as citizens are not out there, they're back here. I mean, we're coming up on, uh, is, are we over 600,000 dead now as a result of COVID? 600, 670, right? 700. I mean, it's, it's stunning. But more, more than the US killed in World War I and World War II and Korea and in Vietnam all put together, happening on, you know, here in our lifetimes in a very brief period of time. So pandemics threaten us. The climate crisis threatens us. I don't know where you are. I think porous borders threaten us. The economic impact of these things threaten us. Dysfunction in Washington that is on display on a daily basis threatens us. Insurrection threatens us. I never thought I would say that in, in my lifetime. So the things that actually pose a threat to us are here at home, not out there on the other side of the planet. Now, if, if, if one accepts that, as the source of a national security paradigm, then what follows is a radical redistribution of resources. And as I say at the end of this, uh, near the end of this book that uh, David referred to, since World War II, we've had the, the biggest and the best, like, unquestionably, the biggest and the best Navy in the world. And it's out there right now, getting ready to do whatever we end up doing uh, with the People's Republic of China. I think actually the United States Coast Guard is a more important asset today in terms of providing for our safety and well being than is the United States Navy. But the United States Coast Guard gets a pittance in terms of, of its annual spending compared to what the Navy gets. So I say, give me a smaller Navy, give me a ro more robust Coast Guard. Let's talk about the, the, the wildfires uh, that have become such a commonplace event out in the West, and probably they won't just be confined to the West. Uh, we have had, since World War II, 
the most, most, the most powerful, impressive, best trained, capable Air Force in the world. And yet the United States Foreign Service, Forest Service doesn't have enough airplanes. And the airplanes they got, last time I checked, are old ones. They're sort of hand-me-downs from the Air National Guard. So I would say, let's get by with the US Air Force and maybe slightly smaller. Now we're gonna do away with it, slightly smaller than it is right now. And let's give the Foreign Service, Forest Service, a far more robust air fighting, air firefighting uh, capability. I think we get more for our money. How likely is this to happen? I don't think it's very likely. Because again, go back to the national security paradigm. The people in Washington, the, the members of the House of Representatives who vote for the highest ever military budget are, 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 are signaling that they're a heck of a lot more concerned about the threats out there in Europe, in Asia, in the Persian Gulf, than they are about the threats back here. And until we change that paradigm, until we change that way of thinking, I think, uh, sadly, we're probably not going to learn the most relevant lessons that we ought to have learned, not only since Vietnam, but, uh, but perhaps more precisely since 9-11. Uh, so thank you very much. Look forward to our discussion. And you, you spoke of perceptions. I was born in 35. Oh, come on, you're not there. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and my childhood was World War II. And we were always told in school that the heroic Russians are fighting the Germans and how wonderful they were. Then all of a sudden, when I was a teenager, wait a second, we don't like the Russians anymore. And uh, I think that. Uh, there's a danger of whipping a population uh, up against another country. And it really worries me all this talk of how the, the, I'm sure that China's a problem. But I, I hope that we aren't going to get in a, a national uh, mood of, of, the, of hating China the way we hated the Soviet Union. Well, I mean, the anecdote is quite pointed, again, because it's, it, it was astonishing, or at least in retrospect, it is astonishing how quickly that mood changed. You know, that the, in, in, in the spring of 1945, uh, we got GIs and, and Red Army soldiers who are meeting and mingling and, and you know, sharing vodka. Uh, by the time we get to what, maybe the middle of 1946, the gauntlet has already been thrown down, uh, and uh, the you know, the, for all practical purposes, the Cold War is is underway. All of that happens in a remarkably brief period of time, and you can't undo it once it's done. I think all this attacks on Asian people is terribly upsetting, and I think maybe. It's spurred on by all this uh, attacks on China. Absolutely. It, it, uh, we haven't uh, talked about uh, Iran, uh, but that's a that's a that's a great objective for a war, isn't it? Well, see, my interpretation of the admit the Bush administration's post 9/11 strategy if I could call it this, sort of the hidden strategy, not publicly announced, is that the administration had far greater ambitions in, the, in its war on terror than anybody was willing to admit. It's my contention that, and I, can, I, can, I offer some evidence for this in my War for the Credit Release book, Admittedly, not fully persuasive because I can't I can't provide that smoking gun document. But it's it's my contention that uh, the Bush administration was absolutely intent on invading Iraq, which, as you said, had nothing to do with 9/11. Not because Saddam Hussein opposed a um, proximate threat, but because Saddam Hussein's regime was obviously weak. 
supported by what was obviously an incompetent military that we had already beaten up once in 1991. And since 1991, they had been under severe sanctions. So it wasn't as if they'd been able to, to rebuild. So we went after Saddam in, in 2003 because it appeared inside the George W. Bush administration that this was going to be an easy win. We're going to knock off Saddam. We we're going to uh, occupy the country and we were going to transform it. And in, in doing that, winning not simply a military victory, but a political one, we would then be positioning ourselves. I'll, I'll use blunt language here, too blunt, but to make the point, we, we, we basically be in a position to issue an ultimatum to others in the region. Hey, ship up, or shape up rather, Start playing by our rules. Ultimata to Iran, ultimata to Saudi Arabia, to Egypt, to all the, the, the troublemakers in the region to bring them into conformity with US policy, US policy expectations, let's put it that way. That was the big game. Now, once, once the invasion and occupation of Iraq turned into a protracted war, obviously, whatever modest realism that big plan possessed disappeared. And therefore, nobody wanted to talk about it. Uh, but, but I am absolutely persuaded. You remember, the, it's a famous anecdote. It's a famous anecdote. General Wesley Clark, who was the Supreme, Supreme Allied Commander, uh, and then uh, retired, not disgraced, but in, not, not in good order. Uh, after 9-11, he talks about this in print. After 9-11, he went and visited some of his old buddies in the Pentagon. And his old buddy said, sir, sir, you're not gonna believe this. You're not gonna believe this, but but they got this plan that after Iraq, we're going to go after country X, Y, and Z. Uh, and I, I think there was some truth to that, some truth to that anecdote. Again, a demonstration of ideological hubris and a, a testimony to the, to the belief that we had achieved something like the mastery of, of warfare. I must admit, when we went into Iraq, I said to myself, how could we possibly do this after Vietnam? And then I ran across a photograph of the day Saigon fell. And there were Cheney and Rumsfeld in Ford's office, mm -hmm. in the Oval Office. And I said, oh my God, Cheney and Rumsfeld saying, so this time we're going to get it right. <laughs> And don't you remember Kissinger, even if I'm, I think I'm correct, saying we, it's a good idea to attack Iraq because Afghanistan isn't big enough that we have to show those, show the world and the terrorists that we're really serious. Dean the John. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. For, for, this is just thought provoking and so great as, as it ought to be. I, I keep my mask on. Such an like safe, and then we want to talk about our policies of uh, that. But um, I have a my, my question is both of you have talked about what this 20th anniversary, or especially looking at it now and what's happened in Afghanistan, means for the US. How do you think the rest of the world is looking at 2011 when they look at these 30 years? Especially in terms of how they look at the US. By way of anecdote, you know, Andy, Andy shared 9 um, uh, 11. I, I, was, I was also there for you at that point. And then suddenly it sort of became uh, slightly sought after by WBUR. I, I had enough of an accent, I didn't really work on this. <laughs> but I was genuinely from the region. <laughs> and I could act as a, you know, I, I could pretend I knew something. <laughs> but if you recall, there was this two weeks when there was an actual debate about whether to go in Afghanistan or not. And Tom Ashbrook had this evening show there before that became a morning yeah. show. 
And I was there three or four times each time, politely arguing it's not a good idea, not for profound reasons, but because my dashboard had been the Soviets entering Afghanistan and me being a student in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. and, and so just saying, you know, it, it, it's usually not a good idea. And, and I, I'll keep this short and sorry it's going on, but then we went in, then we got Kabul, and I happened to be again on his show about eight months in, and he kind of laughed and he said, well, Professor, you kept saying that he couldn't get in. What do you say now? And I remember sort of laughing and saying, getting in is never the problem. Right. It wasn't the problem for Alexander, it wasn't the problem for the British, it wasn't the problem for the Soviets getting out. Right. That's the problem. And 20 years later, I kind of thought of that. But what the thought of what is that? How, how is that seen by the rest of the world? Sorry for this longish story, but, but any thoughts on that? What? David, I would like you to speak for the rest of the world. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think that most of the world would see our exit from Afghanistan as a, as a shambles. Uh, whether they're going to uh, conclude from that that uh, uh, America is a shambles um, is a different question. Uh, so I, I, and I don't think there's enough time has passed yet since we left Kabul to, to know how it will play out. But the immediate reaction is going to be, how could we be so incompetent? So I, I agree that you know only time will tell, uh, and and time will tell in part because we'll see what are our next moves. You know, will, will 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 the Biden administration demonstrate prudence, realism that was absent twenty years ago, or will the Biden administration now embark upon some, its own stupidities? We, we can't say for sure. But if we avoid the worst, my guess is that the impact of, of defeat in Afghanistan will not be particularly significant. And I think I based that judgment on the impact of Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Was a horror, was a humiliation. One of the reasons that the Vietnam War lasted as long as it did is because people argued that we can't leave because leaving would do such terrible damage to our credibility. Well, we eventually left by, by, by having the enemy uh, win. And, and some of the same argument is being made with, that, with regard to Afghanistan. We, we can't allow, we can't fail because that will damage our credibility. I don't know. Uh, you know, the, the importance of the United States as a power The, the relationships with other countries that reflected common interests. Uh, I'm sure we could come up with some set exceptions, but by and large, they remain intact. I personally think that it's absurd that Europe is, continues to be dependent upon the United States for its own security, i.e. the whole NATO construct. But I don't see any evidence that because the United States was defeated in Afghanistan, Europeans are now rethinking NATO, are rethinking the security commitment of the United States. As far as I can tell, they want to continue it. So unless we, unless we behave stupidly, uh, I think that the negative fallout actually uh, would be containable. What would be the really stupid thing we could do? Attack Iran. Yes, that's the really stupid thing I yeah. think we could do. No, I mean yes, stupid. Yeah. Oh. But really, stupid. and that would I think really that would, would do me to it. Really stupid. stupid. Yeah, really, really stupid. stupid. Okay. <laughs> I like that jump to say jump. <laughs> well, that that uh, that would signal the rest of the world. Yes, it would. That the United States has really gone off. So the, say, gone off the deep end. Re-elected Donald Trump. Trump. That would be the signal to the world that we have fully lost 
our senses. Um, that would be a signal that the constitutional order was unstable. That would be a signal that American democracy could no longer be dependent upon. And given Trump's track record in, in presiding over US foreign policy, that is what I think would have policymakers in, in Bonn and in Paris uh, and in Tokyo and in Seoul and in probably in Ottawa <laughs> having, having second thoughts about, uh, about the future of the United States. And I'm sad to say that's, that is not an implausible no, I, I scenario. Definitely is not. And Afghanistan uh, doesn't change the balance of power or anything like that. Uh, I think the tragedy of Afghanistan is that everybody marches in, but they, they don't, it's not for Afghanistan. Uh, the British went in because they didn't want the Russians to come in. Um, the Russians went in because they didn't want a communist government to fail the Brezhnev doctrine. We went in because of, we didn't want Islamic extremism to win. Nobody cared about Afghanistan. Any questions? Would, yeah, um, would you uh, really consider, say, North uh, Korea a, a global threat to the United States? Would you, how would you? What would how would you handle that? What's your opinion on that? I knew I would be famous. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I guess I buy the conventional wisdom, which I would take to be the following. Uh, the overarching explanation for North Korean behavior is the absolute determination of the North Korean regime to remain in power. That's, that's, that's what they care about. They certainly don't care about the well being of the North Korean people. Uh, and the, the military buildup that uh, plays itself out like every six months or so, there's some new uh, episode. I take to mean that they are seeking to pressure the United States and, and, South, Korea, and South Korea, and I suppose Japan too, uh, and China, uh, into providing some sort of credible guarantee that the North Korean regime will continue to exist from now until the end of time. Uh, I don't know if it's within our capability to, to provide that guarantee. Because, because there's no, there's not a heck of a lot of, of trust uh, between the North Koreans and the other parties uh, in this relationship. So it's totally unsatisfactory, uh, but to me, our best course is probably to continue to play out the arrangements, to sustain the arrangements uh, that have kept some version of peace on the Korean Peninsula since 1953, recognizing that there is no, no guarantee, no finality. It's not particularly satisfying, but I don't, I don't have, I don't see a good alternative. I don't, I, I don't need that. They're certainly never going to give up all their nuclear weapons. That's, uh, that's a goal that we shouldn't even try to seek. That's where it's going to fail. But they're not really a global threat to the United States, right? Well, we know they're, they're a global threat only in the sense that we now believe, I think we know that they possess nuclear weapons and any any use of a nuclear weapon anywhere uh, is, a, is a disaster of, of global proportions. And they have a missile that could probably reach California. Thank you. Yeah. Some are comments on the polarization. How do we, how do we overcome this uh, this polarization that's taking place? You mean talking about know, the domestic polarization? Yeah, domestic polarization. I, you know, it's, it's interesting what you just said. That, you know, a re-election of uh, Donald Trump or someone possibly like him is a problem. It could be even worse. <laughs> Um, is 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 a is a real issue, and this polarization is something that we all grew up with. We don't we really when we were 
when we were young, this, this really didn't exist. Uh, my first tour in uh, Germany in the mid 1970s, they were more polarized than we were. We used to talk about it. The Germans were, yeah, in the, in the 70s. Everybody was saying, no, your fault, your fault. And there was your fault, your fault, no. But, um, you know, we are, and, and uh, uh, overcoming this is, uh, is a real challenge. Don't you think the, uh, this happened in Spain before the Civil War? Neither side could reach a compromise on anything. And the discussion wasn't, you're wrong, it's your evil. Right. And uh, I find myself falling into this myself, thinking that some of these Trump guys are actually evil. Um, and I, I don't know how you get around that. Abolish the internet. <laughs> yeah. 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 Social media. Social media yeah. is not, it's amazing to me that something was designed to pick up girls at Harvard right. <laughs> could now be this destructive <laughs> force. <laughs> well, 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 my tech what, officer. What happens that? That's basically. Yeah, my, my tech officer in, uh, in Vienna described it as the Antichrist. <laughs> 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 yeah. There's one thing that we, we talked around, um, and I think everybody is aware of. Uh, Mr. Basevich mentioned that the Congress uses foreign threats as an excuse for a lot of the decisions that they make rather than the domestic threats. And I think lying at the base of this is the fact of Eisenhower's warning of the military industrial complex. It boils down to getting reelected and needing money to get reelected. A lot of money comes from donors in this area. And uh, you know, when we're spending such a large percentage of our tax dollars on the military. And we have so many overseas bases. It's like producing a lot of hammers, and everything starts looking like a nail. How how do we overcome something like that in our leadership? We, we don't really have any leaders that are going to lead us. The people are going to follow in the right direction. I guess is what I'm saying. And and when it's the problem so complex, and you put the internet in with it also, I don't. I'm looking for a way forward to this mess. And I don't. I seems like we're heading down. A, a trail that is unavoidable. I hate to feel that pessimistic, but uh, every day it gets uh, enhanced by what we read in the news. What we see. You mentioned all of the problems and all the threats that we have, but the majority of people want to go in one direction, and yet our, our so-called leaders are going in another direction because they want to maintain power. They might need money to maintain power, and when so much money comes into government. And it seems to taint the uh, direction that we, we should be going. Well, that's another dimension of the problem. And of course, yeah. we, we had a, I can't remember the name now, but the Supreme Court decision that basically um, Citizens United, Citizens United, United. Uh, that made it impossible, I guess, to control the amount of money mm -hmm. uh, in, in politics. That's maybe the ultimate source of, of corrupting our, our politics, I suppose. A different court could render a different decision in a similar case could undo that. Uh, I don't know enough about the politics of the Supreme Court to say whether that's, that's plausible, but certainly you've put your finger on an important uh, part of the problem. You know, money in politics and the, the primacy that people in office assign to staying in office. That's, that's, a, that's objective number one. And objective number two is, is way, way down there, way down yeah. there, uh, uh, lower in the back Remember, Citizens is United held that corporations were people. Yeah. And, and the famous <laughs> Molly Ivins, the columnist in Texas, said, I will believe that corporations are people if Texas executes one. <laughs> 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 well, this has been a good discussion, Professor Whipple. Thank you very much for organizing it for us. It's uh, it's always uh, great to have you. I don't know. Does any 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 questions coming through chat? No. Okay. Yeah. I mean, this is. Uh, I mean, some of these things we've touched on are. You know, I've I've heard the word. You know, 
And we, I think we use the word threat a lot. And national security, I think a lot of times it's, it's just, there really is no threat. I mean, uh, you know, the recently reviewed a book in which the author said Iran is a threat to the US. Well, it's not a threat to the US. And I mentioned you, we use the word threats in national security, like like, like baseballs and spring training. We're all throwing these things around. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, they, I think uh, the biggest threat that, that we have is we threaten ourselves. Yes, that's a real threat. Yeah. And somehow, you know, getting on the same page with, uh, you know, our fellow citizens. And I, like they said, I don't have the answer. Um, I wish I did. I, I will say not everything they say is wrong either. See these two young women? Yeah. They have the answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're, they're in my class. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. They're, yeah. they're, they're, they're they? of the generation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're hoping to learn the answer, but I don't think they have it yet. Yeah. But, I, you know, and, and like, I, I, you know, it's a, I don't think problems are necessarily solved. They're more alleviated. Often. <laughs> That's true. But there's some problems that, you know, just get, we are human beings, you know, and so on. I call myself a little anxious whenever I hear the word when it comes to intelligence, truth to power. You know, I'd say more facts as best as we know them as human beings would be a better answer uh, because it always means I've got the truth and maybe maybe you don't. Uh, but uh, it's uh, it's great to, to have had you here. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, David, you're a witness to history and, uh, <laughs> and, and still you know, active, uh, you know, I think we, we have to be active participants uh, in our in our political culture. So I would thank you very much. That's all I can say. Thank, thank you. you.